you were listening intently. Thank you for the feedback. All right. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, just go over what we're what NOAA is doing in terms of uh, plume cap calculations right now in in a, in a sort of operational environment. Uh, I'm going to cover a little bit of the terminology that that's being used that. And then also just go over uh, the definitions for a plume and a trajectory, the kind of products that we're producing for the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is sort of working in collaboration with the World Meteorological Organization, and uh, some potential uh, plume products that we might uh, have available in the future. So let's move on to the definitions. The terminology, uh, as I mentioned, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, that really describes to some extent the history of, of why is NOAA doing this and how did we get into this position. Uh, after the Chernobyl accident, there was a, a, a lot of uh, complaints, in, at least in the European countries, that they did not have a, a, they had a lack of information, lack of communication, they didn't know what was going on. They, didn't have the tools available to them to assess the information. So, so afterward, the, the IAEA approached the World Meteorological Organization and, and, and basically asked if they could do several things. Uh, one of them was providing for some kind of plume dispersion products uh, from the countries that had that capability, if they could produce those products and distribute them to uh, mem WMO member countries in the event of an accident. And the other thing the, the IAEA wanted to use was the uh, global telecommunication system from WMO uh, to transmit uh, emergency messages to provide early warning notifications of, uh, in the event of an accident. And uh, both of these are, are in play today with, with the situation. The GTS is being used by IAEA to transmit this Mercon message. I, I don't know if some of you received this or not. And it does provide updates, regular updates as to what's going on. And then the centers that have signed up for this, you know, to, to participate with, with IAEA, the WMO centers, uh, NOAA out of Washington, D.C. is one of them, as well as the Canadian Meteorological Center, uh, the UK Met Office, uh, the French Meteorological Office, uh, China the uh, China Meteorological Agency, Japan as well, Russia, Australia, and there's eight, eight total. So that's, that's how we got into this business. And it was essentially NOAA back in 1992 agreed to participate as one of the regional specialized meteorological centers for transport and dispersion products, which is a, a WMO designation. Now, there's a lot of uh, information flying about with regard to uh, what's going on with emissions, with how to, how to evaluate them. And, and there's really only a few things. You know, I, I'm not a, a radiological expert. I'm a meteorologist. But there are a couple of things that are useful to remember that you can use to help interpret the kind of things that you're seeing either in the media or the kind of products that are, are being generated. And uh, one of, one of them is the, is the emissions. So emissions for radiological products are uh, expressed in becquerels. And that is an, uh, defined as a count per second. So a count being a, a disintegration, you know, something that would register on a, on a Geiger counter, for instance. The, the old units for emissions are curies. And uh, the, radio, uh, the, the, the nuclear scientists, as well as the meteorologists, uh, are switching units around. You know, we, we kind of uh, mix, mix up uh, hectopascals and millibars all the time. They're doing the same thing. You know, they express emissions in curies, or they might express emissions in becquerels. Uh, curie is the represents the amount of uh, uh, emissions coming from a gram of radium, and it's in, in, in comparison to a becquerel, it's it's uh, 3.7 or 37 billion counts per counts per second. So it's, it's actually a very large unit in comparison. Uh, to put this in perspective, uh, if, if a 
3,000 megawatt reactor, power reactor, were running for one year, it would generate about 10 to the 17th, all right? And I don't know what 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 the abbreviation for that is. I know it's like a trillion billion or something like that. Becquerel is a cesium-137. Now, it generates a whole lot of other radionuclei as well. That's just one of them. Uh, in fact, when, when, uh, when a reactor is operating, uh, the, the kind of fission products, you might have several hundred different uh, radionuclides that are being generated as a result of this. Uh, some of them are more important than others. Some have half-lives that's where they uh, disintegrate that are much uh, very short, seconds to minutes. Cesium is a, a rather long-lived one. It uh, has a half-life of about 30 years. Now, on the dose side, so the, 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 uh, the basic measure of dose is the Siebert. Again, that's, a, that's the modern unit. Uh, it's, it's a measure of the biological effect you know, so on human tissue. And once, once you have the air concentration, and if you, if you express the air concentration of, of the radiological species in, in Becquerel's per cubic meter, right, then there are published dose conversion factors for each radiological species. Uh, either in Sieverts per hour or in, in, in the older units of, of REM per hour. I'll mention that in a minute. But these these dose conversion factors, I, I, I'm not exactly sure how they, they determine all of them. I think some of it is, is, is a physics-based calculation based on the energy that comes out of the disintegration. Others might, they might be looking at biological effects. The, the old units are this uh, rhodogen equivalent man, the REM, and you'll, you'll see that ex expressed occasionally. Or you might even see RADs. You know, RAD is a, is a kind of unit that comes out of a, a Geiger counter, and it's more or less related to human effects or health effects. And typically, they, they'll equate one RAD with one REM. But from the standpoint of what we're doing here, and the, the kind of products you'll see, you'll see both units of REM and Sieverts in, in, in a lot of different different displays or in different things that you'll be seeing. And there are 100 REMs per Sievert. You know, so that, that's the kind of number you have to remember, 100 REMs per, per Sievert, if you want to go back and forth. And the other side of this is the protective action guidelines, which are issued by EPA. Now, there are several different categories of this, but the important thing to remember is 1 and 5 REM. Uh, 1 REM is sort of the threshold for protective action. Uh, 5 REM is for industrial, I think for, for, uh, for occupational workers, 5 REM is the annual exposure that they're permitted. So if, if you're looking at the, these units, they, they have a time factor associated with them. So, so for EPA, these protective action guidelines usually refer to about a period of four days, about 96 hours. And so the protective action guidelines sort of start if somebody is going to accumulate a total dose of one REM over the course of four days. Again, to put it in perspective, the uh, International uh, uh, Center for Radiological Protection there's some publications out, and, and I, I think the number for an exposure of one sievert, the cancer risk, that one sievert is a, is a fairly large unit, right? It's 100 rem. The, the cancer risk is 5%. And if you're looking at putting that in perspective, uh, that, that 100 rem, well, the, the background levels of radiation, you know, background levels being that from cosmic rays or, uh, you know, if you're, in an airplane, it's higher than if you're at the ground, but it's on the order of a couple of hundred millirem per year, right? So it's, it's, it's a relatively small number. All right, so now that you're all experts on, on this, what I'm going to do is let's talk about what are we doing with a plume dispersion calculation. So this is the part two. And here's a, an example. Just This is just a demonstration, all right? Of, of how how the plume calculation works, and, and this is for NOAA as well as for 
or any uh, a lot of the other models that are being run, the principle is the same. If you look at here, here over the Japanese uh, reactor, there was a 36-hour emission. So what we're emitting in this case are just particles. Each particle has some radioactive mass on it. And then we track those particles, the, the motion of the particles with the mean wind fields, and this that in this case are coming from the global forecast system, the, the NOAA's global model. So these fields are updated every every three hours, and, and so we have a new new wind field which varies in you know in height and in space and time. And then we use that wind field to move the particles downstream. Now in addition to the, the motion that comes from the mean wind, we also add a turbulent component to that particle motion. So that represents uh, um, various mixing or turbulence processes that might be occurring either in the boundary layer or aloft to spread out the particles. If, if we didn't include, if, no, let's put it this way, if the, if the wind speeds and directions were constant with height, although perhaps changing with time, you would just see this narrow string of particles going out and, and spreading around. But because the, the wind uh, direction and speed varies with height, you know, especially in the boundary layer, as these particles, as we add turbulent motion to these particles, they, they spread out. And because they spread out, e either vertically or horizontally, they end up going in different directions. So you get a, a quite rapid growth, especially in the boundary layer. Now, this particular animation, you know, we're just following these particles uh, almost for 15 days. And it, it shows some interesting features, uh, one, of, one of which is you notice that the, the, the particles will tend to cluster or, or converge in, in certain regions. And, and these are going to end up being convergent zones, you know, air mass boundaries that, that will collect. And what that means from the standpoint of, of, a, of a prediction, I, I know you've, you've heard uh, you know, as we go out in time, uh, model predictions are less accurate. Well, you know, to, certainly, you know, if we were looking at trying to predict the wind direction, uh, you know, uh, over our building, you know, from one 15 minute to one, one hour to the next hour, that could be quite challenging to get it right within, you know, even within 30 or 45 or 180 degrees sometimes. But over the larger scale, if we're, if we're going out many days, you know, the, the models actually do a pretty decent job of predicting the movement of the large-scale weather system. And, and, and these par particles tend to align with that. So sometimes these longer-range predictions are a lot more accurate than, than people give them credit for. Uh, and the other, the other point I want to make about this animation is that, the, as you notice, after, after three weeks, or after 15 days, two weeks in this case, you know, it, it's starting to look a little bit uniform, but it really isn't. There's still a lot of uh, structure visible, and it takes about uh, about two months, you know, for for the hemispheric concentrations to become a lot more uniform. Now, the other thing I didn't say about this particular animation was that we're not really removing any particles. So, in fact, the mass that's associated with each each particle will go down as a result of, of rain out, of, of washout or of deposition contact with the surface. So if, if we were to take a look at it that way, and let me start up another one, and, and essentially this identical calculation, but this time we're looking at the low level concentration near the ground. And now we're looking at the concentrations, uh, in this time, in this case it's been converted to millirem over a four day period. So, and there are differences of an order of magnitude. And you can see that for the same case, you know, by the time it gets to the, to the west coast of the U.S., most of the mass has been removed, you know, either, either by uh, wet or dry deposition. Probably mostly through wet deposition. Wet, de wet deposition is one of the most effective mechanisms for removing particles. You know, when, when uh, if, if you have an area where it's raining, you, know, you could remove within a couple of hours, you know, 95 percent, 99 percent of the mass, the airborne mass. And the doses in this particular case are also very, very low. Now, <clears throat> let's take a look at the 
product that actually is being produced that might be available to you. Uh, and I'm not sure who on, on, the, uh, on the Weather Service side is getting the calculations that are being done every day by NSEPS SDM. Uh, if I can bring that over here. The, uh, the, request, the request comes in uh, at uh, not necessarily regular intervals, but when, when the IAEA uh, needs a, a new product or a new simulation, it will send out its request to the Regional Specialized Meteorological Centers. Now, because this incident is in Japan, it is not an area of responsibility for the United States under this WMO framework. And the, the countries that are in charge or are, in, are the lead for, for responding to IAEA are Beijing, uh, Tokyo, and Obinsk, which is in Russia. So that, that's their region. If, if we had an incident in Central or South America or in the United States, for instance, the Washington and Montreal centers would be the lead. In, in Europe, it would be uh, Exeter from the UK Med Office or Toulouse. And there is, each of the centers runs a, uh, hosts a web page where the, the products from all the other centers are posted so that we can, uh, in, in effect, have sort of a poor man's ensemble uh, when interpreting the, the RSMC products to see how well, how it compares with some of the other model predictions. And, and, and I think right now in the, in the operational uh, framework that's being uh, conducted at NSEP, they are running this four times a day now with each new forecast in addition to any requests that come from IAEA. And, and the product that comes out, uh, and which some of you are on the email distribution list for the PDF file, has uh, several pages associated with it. The uh, first page is a cover page that describes the simulation. And I think virtually every one of these so far that we've done uses a unit emission. And, and what that means, if you look on the uh, sort of the middle of that bottom uh, of the text, it will say what the release was. It was cesium-137. And it has an emission rate, in this case, of 0 0.04 becquerels per hour over a 24-hour period. So you multiply those two numbers together, and you get one. So one unit was released. And uh, from the earlier definitions and discussion, you know that you know one becquerel is extremely small number. So this will never turn into anything significant if you if you to multiply by a dose conversion factor. These uh, products were intended to go to the meteorological offices in the various countries, as well as the IAEA. And there are experts at these locations that know to multiply the uh, unit emission plots by the actual emission rates to get true concentrations. It also, this also describes uh, that we had uh, de deposition turned on as well as wet removal. So that, that's the first thing is to really to know what, what this uh, product run was. The next, the next plot will be a trajectory plot. And a trajectory plot's run with every, with every scenario. And the intent of the trajectory plot is not to, uh, <clears throat> to de describe the plume structure, but the intent is to uh, give you a quick comparison of our meteorological forecast versus the forecast from some of the other centers. I, I, during the particle animation, you know, what I, what I should have said and I forgot to say was that when you follow the path of any one particle, you know, that essentially represents the trajectory. And that, that's what we're looking at here. We're just really looking at three trajectories. We're only following them with the mean wind. In this case, there's descending motion. And they start at three different levels. But, you know, it, it certainly does not represent the plume structure that you might get from a release at that time because to describe a release, you would have to follow thousands of particles, you know, each ex experiencing not only the mean motion, but the turbulent motion. You know, again, that was why I started with that particle animation, to, sh to give you some structure or some sense of the complexity of, of, the, simul of uh, the complexity of the flow that you might get and how the, the trajectory itself is not really representative of that. But it is 
really a great tool for comparing, say, the meteorological forecast fields from the uh, GFS model with that from the Canadian Met Center or from the UK Met Office. Because it does give you a, a quick visual view of the integration in space and time of the flow field. The next three frames represent the air concentration predictions. These are 24-hour average air concentrations. You can tell uh, from the title, so the integration time. And uh, in, instead of a simple air concentration, it's expressed as an exposure, which means that instead of just becquerels per cubic meter, it's becquerel seconds per cubic meter. All right? So that means that if the health physicist who gets this product knows that 10 to the 17th becquerels were released, he could just multiply the inner contour, uh, you know, the, let's say the yellow area, which is right near the source, and he would know that the, the concentration would be 10 to the 8th uh, becquerels, becquerel seconds per cubic meter. And now, knowing that say the dose conversion factor for uh, uh, cesium is 10 to the minus 11th uh, 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 rem per hour per, per becquerel per cubic meter, okay? you have a time unit in there. So when you multiply those two together, you now get essentially the time integrated dose over this 24-hour period. So but that's what, that's what the end users of these products uh, do with them. But for us, looking at this, it really just represents a relative dispersion factor. The, the, lower, the, the lower the number, each, each order of magnitude going down is, is a, essentially an order of magnitude less dose that, that somebody would see at the end. Uh, the, next, the next frame is the next 24-hour period. So in this particular case, the, the emissions were a 24-hour emission. So after this period, the emissions have stopped. But you can see there was a change in wind direction, and, and there was now flow going in two different directions. And concentrations, of course, are, 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 are a little bit lower. The, the other thing I want to say is that the colors change. So if you look in the first time period, uh, yellow represents 10 to the minus 9th. In the second time period, yellow represents 10 to the minus 10th. So they drop. The, the colors of the, the concentration contours are scaled. Uh, from max to min independently on every frame. So this doesn't make a good animation. You would have to hold the contours constant to do that. And then finally, you can see the emission stopped. The material is away from the source and, and, and heading both to the southwest and the, and the northeast. And the very last, very last frame shows the, the deposition, the total deposition over the 72-hour uh, simulation. And you can see that there are two hot spots just downwind of the source and, and out, out in the middle here and off in the Pacific. And probably this little hot spot in the middle is because there was a precipitation area there. And uh, the, the other part of this is, is deposition is probably more important in the long term than uh, air concentration in computing health effects and computing uh, dose from, from radiological events. And this is because the, you know, when it's in the air, it goes by pretty quickly. But if it gets deposited on the ground, every day you're going to be subject to, you know, dose or, or radiative, uh, radiation from, from what was deposited. And that's why the great concern for things like cesium. Because once it deposits, it's going to be there for the next, you know, well, half-life of 30 years. It's going to be there for quite some time. And so even though the, the daily you know, REM per hour dose might be small and might be below the EPA four-day threshold, they do have thresholds for different, different exposure levels. So if you're going to be living in that area for many years, the, uh, the protective action guidelines actually are a little bit lower for you. Now, the last uh, thing I wanted to uh, go over with is, you know, what what other things are available, you know, to to us in NOAA, uh, and I want to I know from on the on the forecast office side, there's this document, uh, the guidance document 10518, which was just 
reissued uh, this uh, last July 2010. And that does describe the RSMC products. It also describes, to some extent, the relationship of NOAA with uh, other federal agencies. The, uh, our radiological events, you know, NOAA is not the lead federal agency. We're not the radiological experts, but we are, we, we can help other agencies interpret the dispersion products in, in lieu of, of uh, the meteorological conditions, right? I mean, the forecast offices have uh, local knowledge and, and can provide some interpretive guidelines to situations that are occurring in, in their region. And so one of the things that was mentioned in that document was a, a website, uh, this www.highsplit.noaa.gov, where you could do various uh, short-range simulations. Unfortunately, about the same time this document came out, the website went down, and it's been down since. This is not this is not a uh, ARL or, or OAR site, so this is out of our control. But meanwhile, you can go to our web server, and we have a clone system running that is very similar to what the operational site used to be, and we are expanding and adding new products. To that, and, and I'm just going to show you briefly uh, what you would see when you went to that page. And it's mostly focused in on short-range, local-scale problems. We have not uh, addressed any simulations, any really long, long-term, long-range simulations in that. It was really designed to support local forecast office needs. And uh, right now, you can uh, choose uh, chemicals. You can do chemical simulations, which does, which is also key to protect protective action guidelines. Uh, you can do uh, the prescribed burn option. There's also just a generic uh, simulation. And uh, unfortunately, uh, maybe fortunately, unfortunately, we were working on a we started working on the nuclear nuclear scenarios. And uh, right now, for testing, we do have a, a, a sort of a nuclear detonation option available, which. Bad timing at this point, but uh, it is there, and you see it there. It's, it's not really meant to be used for reactor accidents. You know, the difference between a, a, a the nuclear detonation scenario. This was done to to look at terrorist incidents. Uh, the difference is that in in that situation, all the fission products get released at once. You know, in a in a reactor accident like in this situation, you know, the fission products sort of leak out slowly. So it, it's kind of a different source, and and the source term. For that is actually defined uh, by like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They they have models to describe emissions from from uh, reactor accidents. You know, the a nuclear uh, a power reactor generates fission products over the course of its operation. So they accumulate in the core, and then when the, when the, when there's an accident and the core gets damaged, those fission products start leaking out. So it's it's a, it's a more complex source situation. And uh, <clears throat> the last thing I wanted to uh, say what's in the pipeline uh, for this particular uh, website, and hopefully soon the, the operational one, there is updated Comet training coming that's going to really describe to, to, the, to everyone how to use these products, how to run them, going through different examples. Uh, we are working on a Aloha chemical source model to add to this. So instead of having to specify the, uh, the actual emission rate from, a, from an accident, you can specify something a little bit more generic and let the model figure out what the emission rates are. So we're going to do a little bit for, for the chemical accidents like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is doing for the, the uh, power plant accidents. And, and we have been working on a radionuclide option as well to do those calculations, but that's still in the testing phase. And we're hoping to have a, we're hoping that the NOAA can get that operational high school web server up and running soon. And uh, that, I think, terminates what I want to say. So I'm not sure uh, how this works, if I take questions or or, is any, or even if anybody's still on the line. I have no idea. Uh, yeah, people are still on the line. At least one, two people are.
Well, I, I think if there are no questions, then, uh, then this is the end. Okay, if there are no questions, uh, speaking from somebody in the middle of the Pacific, we'll say thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Parallel uh, modeling on the oceanographic front in terms of the deposition of material either from the, the presumed uh, flow of the seawater that's cooling the reactor into the Pacific uh, off Japan or secondly from I think you called them you know rain events and other things that would uh, knock the stuff out of the, the atmosphere into the ocean. Uh, that was being discussed. I don't know if anybody in NOAA has actually started that activity yet, that modeling activity. But certainly those models exist. They were using them for Deepwater Horizon to some extent. Uh, but how it applies here, I'm not sure. Okay, good. Thanks. Yeah, hi, Roland. It's Tony out in Boulder. Yeah, I don't know if uh, you want to go ahead and just tell them that uh, there is that real quick uh, training brief we put together with Barbara last Thursday and Friday. And if anybody has questions on how to get to that, just to send an email to you or myself, and we can provide access to how to find that on the learning management system. So there's there's no there's no web link yet for that, or uh, we're we didn't know the policy or anything, so this was done so quickly, we put it inside the learning management system, the Weather Service uh, sub learn Center, and thus uh, every Weather Service employee has access to it, but there's no easy way to find it. Unless I'm, not sure, I'm not sure about you know, the answer to that. You'd have to go through... Uh, okay, well, I'm working management. through the region, so just you know, a reminder to whichever regions are on it, if they have a question about how to get to that, I'll be the contact point. Anthony Hello, Roland. Can you hear me? Yes, coming close, coming through clear. Yeah, this is Bill Ward. This is Bill Ward out in the Pacific Region headquarters. This is the first time I've used it on a computer, <laughs> the, the go-to meeting. So, wasn't sure how this would work. I, I'm. I, I haven't had a chance really to get into the training thing on um, LMS yet. I'm wanting to do that. I've just been so busy because our, our Guam office is doing forecasts um, for all of this. And I guess one of my biggest questions here is, you know, we're going through this and perhaps it's in the training module, which I'm kind of hoping it is. At what point do we start looking at this as kind of, you know, having to, you know, maybe spin up our MWO for um, aviation SIGMETs or even hazard SIGMETs for some of this? Because, I mean, I know you went through and explained what all this is, but when does this kind of become an alert on, you know, the, yes, the and, amount of... and in fact, there was, a, there was a teleconference call about that about an hour ago where they were working out those details. I wasn't on that. Uh, FAA, I believe, has uh, defined a threshold, uh, and uh, if I get this right, it was point, 0.5 millirem per hour was the, was the threshold for aircraft encounters to issue a SIGMET. Now, okay. But I mean that that's that's those discussions are going on right now, and and how to do that, and who's going to be notified, and who does the model runs, and those are, you know, the key to all this is knowing the source term. Understood. And uh, so unless unless and, and maybe that's the answer is is you know if if the airplanes have radiation monitors on board, you know they can they know what to do. But I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know enough about that. I can't really answer that question. No, no, no. That's fine. I, I was just kind of curious because I know that you know we're getting through this all through the SDM, or some of us are now, and and I and it does certainly help. And thank you for going through this so that I understand a little bit more about uh, the the units and how the trajectories and all that stuff are going. I, I truly appreciate that. Well, I mean, if there are no other questions, then I'll, I'll, I'll shut this thing off. They left me in charge. Well, then, uh, 
Thank you for listening, and uh, we'll maybe do this again. <laughs>